Welcome. In this interview on Accept Truth with Joy, we're going to be talking with Barry Bickmore, and he is a professor at Brigham Young University. His research disciplines are geochemistry, hydrogeology, and environmental geology, and mineralogy and petrology. So we're going to now speak with Dr. Bickmore. So I'm Barry Bickmore. I'm a, a professor of geological sciences at Brigham Young University. I've been here about 20 years. Um, I got a PhD in geochemistry from Virginia Tech. Um, and uh, went before, before going there, I went, uh, got my, my undergraduate degree at BYU. So just a, a, a BS and then PhD, no master's? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you do a postdoc after too? Yes, I did one at the University of Colorado. Awesome. And then uh, right after that, hired here at BYU? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so I was a postdoc for, post for a year and a half. And then what year did you start at BYU? Uh, 2001. 2001. Okay. And tell me a little bit about like your, like before this, like, where did you grow up? You know, you're, I'm assuming you remember the church your whole life or. Yeah. So I'm one of those fifth generation type of Mormons. And uh, so I, I actually grew up in California. I, I in junior high, I was, uh, uh, lived in Orem, Utah, but uh, the rest of the time I was in various parts of California. What high school did you go to in Orem? In, in Orem, I, I went to junior high. So oh. I, I went to Orem Junior High in Orem. Okay. Um, but I lived right by where Canyon View is right now. Yeah. So, uh, and in fact, that's the neighborhood I live in. Right oh, now. you've gone back to your roots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my sister lives, uh, bought the house for my parents so that oh. we used to live in. So um, she lives around the corner from me. Right. That's awesome. Um, and you're married, kids? Yeah, I have. I have married. My wife's name is Keiko, um, and I have three kids. They're all three going to BYU at the moment. Oh, great! I've got two going to BYU right now too. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. Um, and when did you become interested in like science, or when did you think you know this is for me, or I want to be a geologist, or you know, tell me a little bit about that part of your history? Well, uh, I. In all the stuff my mom saved from uh, um, from elementary school, I have this one worksheet um, that you know it says you're supposed to draw what you want to be when you grow up. Mm -hmm. Right? This was maybe third grade or something like that, and I drew a professional baseball player or a scientist. So one of those didn't work out. But. <laughs> <laughs> and that became clear, you know, around junior high time. <laughs> that, that wasn't going to work out. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, well, great. Well, thank you for being with me today. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I, we were discussing off, off the call a little bit that, you know, I, I needed, I, I wanted to talk to someone that knows a lot more about geology than me and how the process of science fits into, you know, the kinds of things that we talk about with with geology. And, and uh, so I'm, I, I uh, ha actually had a few people give me your name. So I'm really grateful that you're able to talk to me uh, this day. Um, I've read some of your stuff. I actually really loved this essay. Tell me a lot about this essay, The Science of Storytelling. I guess you've also published some stuff off of this as well. But tell me, do you, do you give this out to your students? Or how did this come about, this science of storytelling idea? Um, well, I, I, was a uh, when I, when I was an undergraduate, I got minors in chemistry and philosophy because my sister told me that hey, you should get a minor in philosophy because, um, you know, they really teach you how to write in that uh, discipline, uh, which is true by the way. It was one of the better things I did in college, I think. Um, but uh, so I figured out that. Uh, I could get a minor in philosophy while only taking stuff that was uh, that I could count toward the GE requirements. So I did that, and 
it turned out there were a couple classes on history and philosophy of science and science and religion issues and things like that from the philosophy department that were really influential to me and helped me sort of um, put things into perspective about, you know, science, like, like trying to reconcile uh, scientific findings with, with my religion and things like that. Um, and I felt like when I started teaching introductory um, classes, uh, science classes, right? I, I felt like they never did a decent job that I could see of, of introducing what science is really about, what it's really like um, to the students. Uh, and at least if they if they did try to talk about how um, creativity uh, comes into science and how um, you know any particular uh, finding was always going to be tentative because you never knew what more information you were going to find out that would make you sort of modify your interpretation. Um, they it, when they did talk about that. It was always in such weak terms that uh, it became clear to me that that it had zero effect on the student's conception of science. So the the typical concept of um, how science is done is that here is the scientific method, and you follow this method, and then you get to the truth, right? And and uh, in reality, it's a lot more freewheeling than that, right? And so so. I came up with this concept of uh, science as storytelling. Um, and the, the reason for that is that number one, it's true. What, what do scientists do? We, we observe lots of things and we try and make up expo, ex, explanations, which are just stories that try, try to incorporate all this information in a coherent way and a non-contradictory way, right? And so, um, so it's true, but it's also uh, a kind of a shock for people to hear that. And when you're trying to uh, uh, accomplish a big conceptual change, um, usually you have to hit somebody over the head. And so that's my club is that title, Science as Storytelling, to hit people over the head and say, wait a second, this might be a little different than I learned in, in junior high. And so they pay a little more attention to what's being said. So, um, and the other part of my reasoning for the, the concept of it was, I felt like uh, when people discuss science and religion type of issues or conflicts or whatever, um, they tend to do it in a really trite, way that uh, that sort of um, just simplifies things to the extent that either you know, your religious students are going to feel uh, like they're being put down or just misinterpreted or whatever. Do, and can you give us an example of that just to so the listeners might like um, be a really well, good example. Well, for instance, um, Stephen Jay Gould, okay, so famous paleontologist at Harvard. Um, he promoted this idea of non-overlapping magisteria. Okay, so the, the magisterium is sort of a source of authority, right? And so his idea was that, okay, um, religions, uh, they, their domain is sort of how, um, like the ethics and, and things like that, okay? And science, its domain is basically how the world works, right? And so if, if the scientists will just stay out of the ethics domain and the, and the um, religious teachers will stay out of the, um, the physical domain, I guess, then see, we can all co co coexist happily and, and everything like that. And then the usual... If, if a teacher is using this um, type of strategy to sort of warm up the students in their class to, so that they can then teach evolution or, or whatever, 
right? Um, they'll usually trot out some examples of, of scientists who were uh, who are religious too, and you know, and scientists saying stuff about how um, really the, the religion and the science are talking about different things. And all of, all of that is true to some extent, but it's, it's really oversimplified because like uh, we're, we're both LDS here, I, I take it. And, and uh, like, would you really say that your religion says nothing about the physical world and things that actually happened and, and uh, things like that. Right. And for me, at least the answer is uh, absolutely not. I mean, I, maybe that's not the focus of it, but uh, I mean, the main focus of it, but to say that it doesn't say, have anything to say about that kind of thing is just ridiculous to me. So if, if a scientist were to uh, you know, introduce this to a class, some of the students, usually the ones who are either not religious or belong to a sort of religious tradition that is um, less sort of socially and philosophically conservative, I guess, um, they would say, oh, okay. Yeah, they're just separate, okay. So we don't have to worry about religion stuff in this class or whatever. But there will be, uh, uh, in most universities, uh, there will be in the class a significant number of students who, um, who just, that's not their religion. And, and, uh, and it's clear to them that you are misstating what their religion is all about. Um, and, and the fact is that most scientists um, are not very religious, okay? And the ones who are religious are religious in sort of a more liberal sort of sense, you know, miracles and that kind of stuff, right? So is, that a, is that, do you find that as a problem? Because I've actually had a lot of people push back on me, you know, that this contributes to their, um, their lack of trust in science, in science because they see scientists is mostly leaning left and very not as many leading right and so therefore there's this huge conspiracy against you know voices from the right do you how, how do you deal with that if, if that's well I, i'm a moderate republican and my my attitude is that um republicans for a few decades now have been doing their their very, very best to drive out scientists, you know, with uh, um, starting with the whole uh, creation science and schools and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's really because of various realignments in the political spectrum and so on. It's just, it's just gotten harder and harder for scientists to feel at home there, I guess. And so, so in one sense, uh, on the one hand, I would say uh, to somebody like that, well, sure, that's kind of true, but it's kind of your fault too. <laughs> so you're, you're driving people away rather than trying to, uh, you know, talk things through, um, leave, you know, have a big tent, that kind of uh, kind of thinking. So. Um, so how do but, but most of the most of the thing uh, the biggest reason according to the studies of this kind of thing that so many scientists are not religious is because they grew up in um, the same kind of home that was not particularly religious. So I mean you can imagine that um, you know religious kids grow up sort of having some idea of their place in the universe type thing, mm -hmm. and and non-religious kids still have sort of uh, needs in terms of psychological needs in terms of uh, that. And, and so a lot of them gravitate towards science um, as a way of, of fulfilling that need. Okay, so maybe this comes back to this idea of uh, science as a storytelling, right? Because if what you're trying to do is, is approach people in a different way so they understand what science is, that doesn't seem maybe so threatening to someone who maybe grew up 
with inclinations that science is is somehow bad or something right is, is that kind of your purpose for doing science as a storytelling then yeah so well not the whole purpose like i said part of it is to hit somebody over the head and say uh, to let them know something different than you're used to is being okay. said here um but yeah that's part of it as well as it i mean and we've actually studied the effectiveness of our our program for the science of storytelling program in in uh, introductory classes and um what we find out is that it, it just gives people an out, right? It's like, okay, all the stuff we're going to tell you, we're gonna lay out the evidence and everything, but hey, new evidence could come out next week that makes us change this story uh, somewhat. And, and uh, so, so there will be nothing that you hear that will force you uh, to believe a particular scientific uh, uh, theory, okay? So you can relax and you can listen to what's being said, have the evidence laid out, knowing that, you know, you don't in the end have to accept this just because there's a lot of evidence, right? Um, and it turns out that if people can relax like that and just look at it, a lot of times they can modify their views. And when it comes to religious objections to things like evolution or uh, old earth or climate change or whatever it happens to be, um, like the people are, are, are probably going to, in, in the end, have some kind of combination of what they thought before and what, you know, what this new uh, concept is. And, and uh, that's okay. They're, they're, they're in the middle of this process too, um, trying to gather information and make, make stories in our heads about what's, how this all fits together, right? Yeah. Including the religion stuff. And, and it also, the, the other thing we emphasized in there uh, in that essay was that, um, there are practical reasons why scientists, when they're doing science, even if they're religious, why they don't, uh, you know, rely on uh, miracles to explain things or, or things like that, right? Why, could you, um, just, yeah, give us a few examples. Why, why don't scientists invoke or include supernatural explanations for the phenomena that they see? What, What's the strategy there? Why don't they do that? Even if they are really religious. Well, well, the first practical reason is this. So, so in my religion, right? I, uh, we don't deny that natural processes go on, right? And so, so, um, and these are the things we can study and and manipulate uh, variables in our uh, experiments and so on. Um, now. And we also know that in the past, it's been incredibly common for people to just um, say, oh, the gods are doing this, or, you know, uh, when in fact, um, even if ultimately that's the case, right, there are um, things we can study and try to understand in sort of a more uh, naturalistic framework that will help with us deal with them. And so a, a good example would be um, infectious diseases or whatever, right? So we, we uh, can deal with infectious disease uh, a lot better nowadays because people have said, okay, let's, let's set, set aside possible supernatural causes of disease. And let's just see if we can understand this in a naturalistic framework um, so that maybe we can do something about it, right? Yeah. And, and it's worked. So, so a religious person who's, I think, trying to understand all this and being honest with themselves can say, okay, that is a good practical reason for just putting on the naturalism glasses and setting aside the, the miracle stuff. Even if you take those glasses off sometimes and put your religious glasses on, and, and, and sort of consider the possibility of miracles and, and that kind of thing. 
What, what do you say to those that push back though and say, it just seems like science continues to explain away God, all of these miracles that I used to believe in. You know, I mean, you could go back to God's moving the sun, God's creating the heat of the sun, God's, you know, doing, causing all of these things to happen. And every time science figures something out, it gets rid of that God or it gets rid of that supernatural explanation. Um, you know, and that could go all the way up through evolution, you know, describing how species came about on this earth to how human beings came about on this earth. You know, sometimes I get this pushback where it's like, well, science seems like it just keeps getting rid of God. It get, keeps keeps explaining him, him or her away. Uh, what, what's your response to someone who pushes back like that? Well, I would say um, what they really are saying they want is a proof that God exists and is a certain way or whatever, right? They want, they want some kind of philosophical proof that's unassailable and nobody can doubt and that kind of thing. They want to prove it um, to everybody, not just themselves, right? Um, and my re response is that that's not really feasible, okay? But what is feasible is for you to interact with God and, and uh, see whether, you know, things happen and, and uh, experiences come that convince you that, okay, God's really there. All this other stuff about science and how the, the, the nitty gritty of how the world works and things like that, um, that's all, that's all details, right? What if you settle that question, whether God's there or not, right? And and you can have a a, a relationship with with God and so on. Um, so and and really, what's the point of your religion if you don't, right? Mm -hmm. So so that I, I don't know. I'm I'm all all for people just trying to you know, use science or whatever to try and understand their religion, right? Like if, if uh, you believe in the Bible, right? What's wrong with using ancient languages and, and using um, uh, cultural studies and using archeological studies and things like that to try and understand what was, you know, what's, what the message is and so on. Or like uh, how, like there's uh, different religious people have, you know, range of ideas of how uh, fallible in the individual prophets can be and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I have no problem with anything like that. Just, but, but um, people have to realize that all of those, uh, you know, ways of, of putting science and religion together and, or, other uh, fields, putting all that together with their religion and things like that, all of that has to be treated as tentative as well. Just, just like scientists, uh, science has to be treated as tentative. And it does involve a certain amount of creativity, just like science involves a certain amount of creativity, coming up with these stories for how all this information fits together. Um, but I feel like if you can get to that point where you, you see that point clearly, right, that, where you can understand what you're doing when you try to um, understand the world through science or through religion or some combination of the two or whatever, um, that's what you're doing. You're making stories and, and combining information to try and make sense of things, okay? And, and because we're humans, that's never going to be a foolproof. Right. So, uh, so I, I, I would tell somebody like that, look, you're, you're, uh, if you want to get a philosophical or scientific proof of God existing or whatever, before you reach out and try to develop a relationship to see if that works out, right? Um, that, that's just, putting things backwards. You're, you're trying to um, 
see if you can understand something before even knowing if whether it exists or not, right? It's much more reasonable, I think, to determine that something exists and then try and understand it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I love your attitude about um, tentativeness, this word tentative, right? Because I, I think another word that, that um, Mormons will more relate to is humility and being teachable. Yeah. That, that, you know, we need to know, understand, I love it how you're like, science doesn't know everything and science is trying to huddle around and figure things out. And I like, I like this word of storytelling. We're trying to, you know, repeat this, this process that is iterative and that it's trying to just figure things out. But that same kind of, of, um, of position ought to be also recognized with religion in a sense that religion is tentative. Because another problem that I run into is black and whiteness in Mormonism, where someone thinks that once it was declared, then that's like absolutely how it has to be. And there is never any way to change that, right? Um, do you find yeah. that as a problem too then? Kind of that declarativeness of for sure, for sure, this is exactly how it has to be coming from religion. Just as some scientists sometimes claim that and they shouldn't. Do you find that same thing in religion, even in the church? Oh yeah, well, we, we've all seen it, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, you know, the, you were talking about the racial stuff and, well, just go look on the church's uh, website on the gospel topics ex essay about uh, race. And it says flat out, you know, uh, some general authorities and others, members of the church had various theories about why, uh, you know, why this existed and so on. And they're all wrong, or <laughs> we don't accept any of them, at least, right? We don't, we don't. Uh, yeah, that's a good example. Reject them, basically. So, so, you know, if if you're in our church, at least, and you're still stuck on uh, this idea that that, uh, you know, if if it's said in general conference, then it's infallible, infallible, or something like that. Um, well, you're out of step with the church. Because, I mean, they keep trying to tell us, right. you know, you look back through very statements, uh, you know, Brigham Young, uh, when I came out and told people, you know, I'm more uh, worried about you just accepting everything I say uh -huh. than just then rather than trying to learn it for yourself, you know? Yeah. So, so they, they try and tell us, I mean, but, but there's a balancing act here. Do you, do you couch everything you say as, as, oh, it's all tentative and maybe it's like this and, and so on. Um, it's all, all a matter of just your personal style of communication, I guess, mm -hmm. right? I, you you look at Bruce Arnold or whatever, and he, he has very, this is how it is type of style, whereas other general authorities have been a little looser about it, but you don't find any of them who are just like, Hey, it's whatever, you know, right. it's, so just because we're saying there's tentativity at like, and that we don't know everything, that doesn't mean we're saying we don't know anything. Right. That's important to remember as well. And, and that there are truth claims that are um, exact or very precise, you know, the, the truth sure. claim that Christ resurrected is a fairly, you know, that's, that's a claim that is fairly, you know, how he, how he did it. What exactly does that mean? Of course, there's the details, but did he resurrect or did Joseph Smith actually see the father and the son? You know, these are kinds of claims that that seem to be a little bit more concrete, just as in science, you know, we're pretty sure about the movement of a, of a body relative to another body in, in, gra in gravity, right? Here, here on earth, we know how those things work. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and to think of it in science too, it's the exact same way. We do something in a laboratory, say somebody is uh, like in your type of field is, is uh, breeding fruit flies to, to figure out how they evolve from generation to generation. Okay, so they, they study it, they um, come to some conclusions and then they try to apply that to things that happened in the past. Well, you can't go back in time. Right. So, so obviously, your truth claims about what happened in your lab are going to be stronger than truth claims about how that applies uh, to some time in the past. 
doesn't mean you can't figure out anything about what went on in the past. And it doesn't mean there's, um, you know, not source of, sources of information that you can tap into and try and put together some kind of explanation for what went on. But, but you just have to keep it in perspective of, uh, you know, there's stronger claims and there's weaker claims and there's, there's central issues and there's ancillary issues and so on. Right. I, I, well, I love this idea of storytelling. And if it's okay, I'm going to, on the website, link to your essay and your publications that have resulted from this. Is that, is that okay if we oh, do great. that? Yeah, that'd be fine. And um, um, is there any, I mean, because I kind of want to shift gears now and talk about the other topic that we were going to do, but is there any last thing you want to say about right. storytelling? Yeah, I want to say one thing about this. So, so that science, remember I said that we tried out the science of storytelling uh, um, approach to teaching the nature of science to mm -hmm. introductory science students. And so it worked at BYU, but I had colleagues, I'd give talks about this and so on. I had colleagues who were not really religious or were just sort of, I'm, re I'm spiritual, not religious type of people, that kind of people who were just having fits, you know, teaching in Oklahoma or, or somewhere, <laughs> right? Where where they have a lot of say fundamentalist Christian uh, students in their, their class and they're just getting hammered by their students and they, they would come up with ways to try and, and um, you know, explain the relationship of science and religion and so on to, to the students and they would just make them even more mad. And so they tried this out, the, my program with the science of storytelling and they said it was night and day. They had so many fewer problems. So, so what I wanted to illustrate for your viewers about that was that, you know, yes, most scientists aren't religious nowadays. Okay, that's not always been true, but, but uh, nowadays they aren't. But most of them are really nice people <laughs> that, that really do care about uh, when they're teachers, they do care about their students. And they, they don't want to, to trash your religion or something like that, most of them. I mean, I've known a couple who do, but, but they don't want to. They're desperate. But they, if they're not religious themselves or not religious in the same sense that their students are, it can be nerve-wracking and difficult. And, and most of the time, they just end up ignoring the... the, the um, question altogether if they don't have some way of coping um, and, and end up saying things like, well, we don't talk about that. that this is about what happens in the real world, right? Not about, so we're going to ignore religion. And the, the teacher might be just thinking, oh, I'm just trying to keep it separate. I don't even know what to say about how you should incorporate this with your religious stuff, right? Um, so they don't mean it to be offensive, but I mean, to the students, it's like, oh, the, the teacher is saying, oh, you, you live in fairyland and we're not talking about fairyland, right. which comes off as really, um, um, you know, looking down on, on the students. Hmm. And so, so I just want to emphasize that. So, you, I mean, we've been talking about how most scientists are, aren't religious. And we've been talking about people who will say, well, sh shouldn't that be a reason why you don't trust them? Well, it's a reason why um, you can understand why they're not completely always on the same wavelength as you, right? And have a hard time communicating with you. But, but I just wanna get across the, that most of them are not out to get you. And, and um, they, will listen to you and it takes some effort to sort of understand each other. Mm -hmm. That's what we were trying to do was get people on the same wavelength. It was the science of storytelling thing is not bashing science or bashing religion or whatever. It's just sort of a, a way of look, you know, orienting yourself before you learn all this stuff that might challenge some of your preconceptions. Right. Um, to, to help you see what the, the, your teacher is thinking and help the teacher um, see what the students are thinking and, and, and so on.
right? So. I love that. Love that. Yeah, I, I've, I've dabbled a little bit in some of the, uh, doing some studies as well on, you know, how to help students with this. And one of the things we saw was the effect of a role model. You know, mm -hmm. so it's kind of someone who can stand there and say, now, don't freak out. You know, we're going to figure out how to get through this. And so let's 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 be humble as we go. And then and then that way they don't freak out as much when you get to the kind of some of the truth claims that do go against the preconceived notions. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, I was actually I gave a talk about that this subject at the University of Oklahoma once. And after I gave it some one of the professors there asked, well, don't you think that since you're religious, that sort of gives you more credibility. And, and, and I said, yeah, I, I think it does. But I've had these friends who are not religious and it's really it's helpful for them to, yeah, to, that's great. to come out that way. So I will link to uh, those, those uh, essays and, and publications. Sunshine with me. The doors are open, the skies are too. Sunshine is coming here for me and you, sunshine.